Hi folks, this is the first DL lesson in the deep learning section of the Big Data Application Analytics course. And I'm your instructor, Jeffrey Fox. And this is going to go through your first, or probably not, but for as far as this class is concerned, your first deep learning example. And uh, we take the numbers from the NIST database, a very famous uh, uh, example set that was used to bootstrap this whole field. And we go through it with a very simple network, multi-layer perceptron, and but use the sort of state-of-the-art technology which we can use or you can use for future applications. So this is just to show you, I mean, rather than do any theory, we're getting stuck in and just doing deep learning. So, this is the MNIST data set. It's got a whole set of handwritten numbers. And um, it has been um, tackled by various technologies and proven to be very um, challenging. And uh, it, however, tackled with deep learning networks, it's done extremely well. Here we will use a sort of modest deep learning network, a multi-layer perceptron, and we will get um, Modest performance, 92% success, whereas on a state-of-the-art network, a convolutional network with all the various bells and whistles, it would be more like, I think, 98.5%. All right, so this is what we're going to do. And all of this is available on the Google Colab environment. First, we lay, we better define what a multi-layer perceptron is, because we do need to know at least that. And it is the world's simplest um, neural net, and was actually how it has all started. So we have some inputs, but there are only four shown here. In the example, we have 784 because we have images. And each pixel is a separate input to this um, network. This network will recognize the correlations in the pixels. Um, this uh, particular picture only has one hidden layer. The uh, one we will do, build has two hidden layers. Um, but all the inputs are connected to all the hidden layers. And then the, all the hidden layers are connected to the outputs. The output for our case here will actually have 10 units in it, because the um, number can be classified from 0 to 10. And it will give you probabilities of it being a particular number. That's using the so-called softmax approach. All right, so we're going to do everything on Google Colab for this class. Uh, we have a more dedicated um, GPUs, which is what you use for running these networks. But um, for um, instruction, it is probable that uh, the capabilities of Colab, which actually include not only GPUs, but um, Google's own tensor processing units, TPUs. Um, um, and it has a wonderfully simple Python front end using a variant of the Jupyter Notebook. And it all runs on the Google Cloud. And so you don't have to mess around um, getting logins and everything like that. So you need a Gmail account. You need to sign in to Google Colab, and you need a web browser. By the way, it is not exactly a Jupyter Notebook. It is Google's development of that that they split a few years ago. I don't think for any evil reason, just Google was plowing ahead with Colab, which stands for collaboratory. So we start. Now, um, we have Python commands like print. So we can just type on them when we, we just Get us a new so called notebook. Oh, by the way, that notebook can be solved, can be saved to your own Google Drive. That's one reason why you need a Gmail, because you need to have a Google Drive where everything gets um, saved. So this is sort of nice. You don't, I still remember the day when you got some outputs, it was printed on paper, the paper was. Uh, uh, ordered by your last name, and you went to the, or maybe by your login, and you went to a, a nice sort of thing which had lots of um, slots in it, one for each, uh, for each letter or something, and you picked it up. Nowadays, you don't have to do anything like that. You just use your notebook and look at the answer. 
So here we illustrate two standard things that actually about Jupyter or Colab. We can do a Python command at any time, and we can do a shell command here. Explanation a mark starts a shell command, where here we're finding the version of Python we're running. Actually, it's not we're running, Google is running it. I actually rubbed in most of it out, but there's two important uh, um, tabs here. Plus code will give you a new code unit down below the current code unit, and plus test will do the same for text. Um, so that we will, you, you will actually be using that as you build your, your program. And as far as I can see, it's pretty well documented. And I say, you don't need to know much. Well, you would be good to know Python, but even that is self-explanatory uh, for this particular application, because we're telling you every Python command to use. Uh, here are a few other things. Well, here's the stuff about the plus code. I showed you that on the previous slide. And the plus text. If you want to look at all the wonderful, well, you know, this is pretty old fashioned keyboard shortcuts. I used to do that 150 years ago. Anyway, Control M followed by H gives you the um, um, keyboard shortcuts, which there's, as I say, a huge number of. And if you want to, um, like if you're typing a, a Python command and it has various allowed options. Control space will give you those options. And um, there is uh, some material in the labs section for this class, uh, which is in the book, E354 Handbook, which is, of course, where these lectures are indexed. And you can therefore find out more about Colab, because it will be part of your lab assignment. All right, so we're going to use to use Keras. And we will also use TensorFlow. And Keras is a wonderful environment, I must admit. Uh, people who take Keras really did a great job. I say they did, the people who did TensorFlow, which is not so dissimilar, also did a great job. And it basically allows you to build your own um, deep learning network as a set of commands, which is actually Fortunate that these networks are actually layered, and each command gives you a layer. So effectively, it's relatively straightforward to map a set of uh, commands into a um, into a network. And um, it also Keras not only drives TensorFlow, it drives MXNet and possibly CNTK, which is the Microsoft library. But today, TensorFlow followed by MXNet are the um, systems of choice. And you will find, go to Amazon, you will find books, many books on how to use both TensorFlow and Keras. Okay, we're ready to start using Colab to uh, do our deep learning example, the uh, handwriting recognition for digits. And we first have to set a few things up. Uh, we're going to use pip, because pip is the Python package manager, which allows us to install from external repositories. And we're going to be using our own system called Cloud Mesh just to provide a few utilities. It will be very minor for this particular example. Um, and we're going to use a particular component there called common. <coughs> so. <laughs> we have this explanation mark, which says this is actually not a Python command, but a Linux command, or shell command. And we first uh, download Cloud Mesh Installer, and that installs it. And then we involve download Cloud Mesh Common. So that's just set things up and we can get going. We can finish that. And then we check the Python version with again invoking the shell and the Python 3 command with a request for the version. And then we do the more major installation of TensorFlow. And we're going to use TensorFlow aimed at the GPU. And it's going to be 1.14.0. 1 so. Keras calls TensorFlow. 
as I mentioned, it can also call other packages, but TensorFlow is the most common. Now we want to do a bit of Python uh, things, which again is not so important. It's uh, partly due to the recent Python 2, Python 3 um, change, and uh, we, we were trying to provide some capability with Python 2. We also uh, grabbed this timing routine from Cloud Mesh Common called Stopwatch. So these are all utilities. Now we come to um, Here's a typical data, and it shows you the um, pluses and minuses of the data. It's not very high resolution. It's actually the letter five. And we can see here, we uh, grab the image with um, X train, and we grab the label with Y train, and um, we print the image and the value of um, of the y value, which is five. So this is a, a rather scruffy image, and which is already nicely been labeled as five. So now let's uh, see how we have to do all of this. We download um, the training data and the testing data. Uh, that's all built into Keras. And here it is coming down from Amazon. And then we just check that everything makes sense. We find the number of labels, and that's going to be 10. Then we convert the labels to a so-called one-hot vector with the two categorically um, um, called. One-hot vectors we'll formally uh, define in a few slides time. They're when you represent everything in a binary fashion. So uh, um, zero is represented as um, one followed by nine zeros, one is followed by zero, comma one, eight zeros, and so on. Everything is represented, all those digits are represented by being an on bit, one bit, in one location in a 10 digit binary vector. Now we have to just do a little bit more work on this stuff to get it in the form suitable for TensorFlow. Uh, we have image size, which is going to be uh, 28 squared, uh, which we get from uh, the shape command. Uh, well, that's 28. And then we square it here to get the total size of each image. And then we convert each image. Then we actually have to renormalize the, the uh, data. Um, so it runs between um, 0 to 1. And we're not doing anything fancy with uh, small order. We're, just, we're using float32s, and we're converting it from 0 to 1 by dividing by 255. And we're doing that for um, the training data, the X training data, that's the actual images for training and the images for testing. We uh, find out the nature of our um, model by on the training data, which is most of it. And then we keep aside some of the other some of the data for testing, and we run we we run the so-called inference engine, which actually predicts the characters for the testing data, and we compare the prediction with the previous label, and uh, thereby measure the efficiency of our uh, of our deep neural net. All right, we're continuing to set up this uh, TensorFlow run using the Keras front end. We set the batch size, the number of images that are run together. We'll understand that much better when we go through stochastic gradient descent. Um, the next one is the size of the hidden layer. There's one major hidden layer with 64 units in. Then we have a set of commands which uh, build the, the model. Now, it's sort of exciting that um, learning networks are actually layers. Layer number one, two, three, four, five. And there's the input at the front and the output at the end. Um, well, but that makes it sort of reasonably clear that we can actually specify by a set of of, lab, of, um, of actual calls in the, some language, like here Keras, uh, to um, define it in a, in a sequential fashion. So this says that these calls are one after the other. 
we have here the um, uh, uh, input um, size is uh, the uh, which we calculated in the previous slide. We have um, first the, the one with 64 hidden units. Then we have one with 10, because that's the number of labels. Um, and then we produce, then we print out a summary of the whole thing. And we um, do a little, some plots to lay, like in, um, to, to uh, see what's going on. So this is the printout from Kiras. The model is called Sequential One, a very interesting model. Um, we we um, start off with um, 64 hidden layers. Uh, we start off. We then have 10 output layers, an activation, which is going to be a so-called softmax, and then that will give us the answer. And this has 5890 parameters. Quite a lot of parameters. 51,000 parameters. And you, this is a very useful printout from Keras. Um, it tells you the structure of the of the uh, network. It's good to print it out in case you made a mistake. All right. We now do, we're doing the heart of the problem here. Uh, we specified the model. We now take that specified model, which was a set of layer commands, and we build it with the compile command. Where we also specify the um, nature of the loss function, the, the, the objective function, the things we're minimizing. We specify technically the optimizer, Adam these days is the, probably the most common one used. And we specify that we wish to use accuracy as a measure of success. Then we do the training. Here we are, model.fit trains the uh, um, parameters, which remember 51,000 of the uh, Deepish neural net. It's not really deep, actually. It's just one real layer thick. And um, anyway, we do the training, and we just actually were running it here for one epoch. It won't converge in one epoch. All right, we did the training. Now we do the testing. So um, here, this is the evaluate command, which calls the inference version of the network. It uh, um, and it um, prints out the total accuracy, which is 19, sorry, 92.1%. So these are all um, the losses, the value of the loss function accuracy is what we're more interested in. And so this is just a standard Keras command. And here in uh, one slide is what you have to do to do a pretty non-trivial deep learning problem. It's really quite quite um, simple. It's just collecting all the commands we had on the previous plots. And you know, it is very striking how powerful this high level model is. When I first started on deep learning networks, I didn't realize that this was possible. I mean, this is very clever. In retrospect, it's obvious, but it's still not trivial to do things pre-retrospect. Perspectively. Okay, the last slide of this lesson, which is the uh, actually the second lesson of the beginning of the uh, section on uh, deep learning, and um, we points out we've just did a simple case. Um, if we want to improve it by giving it a greater modeling power and addressing things like vanishing gradients, then you need to use things like dropout and add more layers. The actual preferred architecture for this problem is a so-called convolutional neural net, which we'll discuss a little later on. But we wanted to get you started on this very simple uh, multi-layer per uh, perceptron to show how even with that you can get non-trivial results, and it really isn't that difficult to do. So that's the end of this lesson. Thank you.